Hey everybody, I'm in this weird room with these lights that are like laser beams going through my head, so I'm going to turn them off so you're not distracted, or I can just go full screen too. Maybe I'll just do full screen. That way I can see. Let's try to turn them off. Hang on. Lights off. Yeah, that works. Anyway, I'll go full screen as well. So big thank you to everybody for being here. Let's just jump in. A lot of news to cover today. And uh, let's see what we have going on. This show today is going to be called the number one crucial chart. And I'll explain why it is so important. A little economics lesson as well as we go through this. So let's jump in, as we always do. And of course, this is entertainment, not financial advice. The story today really is about the most important chart, plus a ton of other news. But let's get straight to the heart of it first and not waste any time. So um, I've done a lot of work with Metcalf's Law. And if you guys want me to do some Metcalf's Law tomorrow around Ethereum and Solana, let me know. But this is probably the most important Bitcoin chart. We are talking about Bitcoin today. But if you want me to look at some numbers for daily active users, etc., and the impact on price, let me know. Um, and basically, I have proven that 83 to 84% of Bitcoin and Ethereum price is explained by the number of daily active users. So he addresses the network effect. But if you look at this chart here, this one chart makes it very clear what will happen to the price of Bitcoin in the long run. Not hopium just mathematics. And the amount of Bitcoin that is up for grabs, that amount on exchange balances and future supply for mining is really thin and it's heading to zero. In fact, Jamie Coots from Bloomberg agrees with me too. He has also done a lot of work on Metcalf's law. Now, the number of on-chain entries is going up forever as long as the Bitcoin protocol survives. And we all know that from Economics 101, as demand increases and supply goes down, price goes up. It is the most basic les lesson of economics now. The green line here is the balance on exchanges and future supply compared to the up purple line, which is the total entities. Everything is going perfectly, swimmingly. Everything is going in the right direction as we go forward. So I just want to share that most important chart. But let's talk about Bitcoin versus other main asset classes. So far, year to date, just since January 1st, 2023, Bitcoin's up 45%. Of course, that fluctuates from minute to minute because it's volatile. But the narrative is changing from speculation and gambling to really saving and long-term investment. And this chart should get people's attention. If you look at the performance of Bitcoin, as I mentioned, up 45% year to date. S&P 500 up 6.44%. NASDAQ up 12%. Dow up 15%. And gold, 5%. Uh, it's, it's a dwindling on the day that gold can be flat. But here, this is a very meaningful divergence between Bitcoin and equities and other asset classes for the first time in well over a year. And the FTX collapse back in early November was the only other decoupling event, but that was very short-lived and we've way more than rebounded since then. So all good, as they say, in Bitcoin land. Now let's talk about another piece of Bitcoin news. Uh, there's a lot of stuff spread about, you know, Fiat is beating Bitcoin. This was an interesting one. We have our friend Augustin Carstens, who is really very excited about a central bank digital currency. But there was a beautiful letter written by a wonderful author. I shared it on Patreon earlier today. I just thought it was worthwhile really to explain what Bitcoin is and what Fiat is and why. Fiat, no, Augustine, it did not win. Bitcoin will win for many, many reasons. But uh, Augustine is from the Bank of International Settlements, BIS, and uh, they have one central aspiration, and that is a central bank digital control money, a full integration of governmental domination, enforcement, surveillance, control, all rolled into one new digital fiat currency with a heavy dollop of degrading inflation on top. Same stuff I've been talking about for two years. And then on the other side of the table, you've got Bitcoin, rules-based network without rulers, fixed issuance, uninflatable, globally distributed, controlled by no one, usable by anyone. That is the absolute antithesis of what fiat money is. And remember, Bitcoin was created out of the global financial crisis because of infinite money printing. And let's be clear, 
Bitcoin is anti-inflation, anti-totalitarian technology, and, and <laughs> you know, Augustine saying it is lost does not make it so. And I'll bet you one Satoshi, you know, that you already own some of your own because in your mind of minds, you know that fiat is failing. And if I'm wrong, download a Bitcoin Lightning wallet, send me an invoice, and I'll send you that Satoshi or a full Bitcoin Augustine. I will up the ante if you can get off the fiat bandwagon. So let's jump in to some more stories of the day. First of all, there's a lot of buzz around layer twos right now. Um, Arbitrum, everybody is now talking about it. If you look at the number of transactions on Arbitrum, what is really blowing us all away is the number of contract deployments. This is a great sign that developers are choosing to deploy their applications at a very high rate. And the current week is still in progress. But if you look at the blue, which is Arbitrum, that is the amount per week. And Optimism is in red. You see, Optimism is dwindling away. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the overarching total aggregate amounts on Arbitrum are going through the roof. So all in all, it looks like the layer two that is really getting a lot of traction is, of course, Arbitrum. Uh, let's talk about Optimism for a second, though. Coinbase is building a base on a layer two, a decentralized layer two, which is very exciting. They call it base. Coinbase base makes sense. And this is huge news. This is a public US company. It's running a trust minimized execution environment for customer assets. This is the first step of many of software eating all of finance, all of traditional finance, anti-tradfi. That's why I'm big into layer ones, layer twos, because I believe in decentralized finance. And maybe a track, I could be wrong, but setting up an immutable decentralized layer two could be a way to sidestep SEC scrutiny. Now, I don't know if that is the trigger for this. It could be, may not be, I'm just speculating here. But I do believe the future is decentralized. And Coinbase tell us that they've twice considered launching on Binance Smart Chain. Uh, they're L1, but they decided to walk away. And they chose the Optimism stack uh, because it's modular, open source, uh, highly scalable, highly interoperable, etc. But proved to be a game changer for Coinbase and provided them with the opportunity to build their own chain called Base. Now, they are launching this mainnet in approximately eight weeks, and Base will be a permissionless L2. And despite speculation, there is no KYC blockchain. So we'll, we'll see where all this goes. But uh, fascinating times ahead for Coinbase. But I don't think they'll be able to use it as a true transaction system in real time because settlement does take a lot of time on optimism. Now, speaking of other L2s, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, Ran kicked off something that brought a lot of discussion on Twitter and totally jumped in. Um, I think it was Sandeep from Matic said there will only be one layer one, and that is Ethereum. And some people took offense to that. I'm sure, you know, Cardano, Avalanche, etc., Phantom all got up in arms. But I thought this was interesting because I've been tugging on this thread for a long time, and that is <laughs> why are L2s there, etc. And, you know, his retort was basically, you know, fees aren't driven by the resources used like compute or bandwidth, but by state contention. That is the driven demand. Imagine and one million people want to buy 1,000 NFTs. Of course, that is a lot of contention, and that can drive up a lot of activity. Now, what was interesting, basically, the TLDR for this is an L2 can never beat Solana when it comes to price. That's the first piece I got from it. Um, and I've always said as well, L2 means two problems. It's complex. It gets choked up, etc. And L2 networks exist because the L1, which is pretty much always Ethereum, is terrible, slow, expensive, etc. And it makes little sense on Solana because they're already the fastest and the most inexpensive. So I thought that was a, a nice view of L2s. And as you know, I'm sort of not a big believer in L2s. I think the core chain, the pure form, is always the best. And I do hold Ethereum and Solana. Now, the Solana NFT marketplace just breached 4 million, mi million NFT unique users. And they're about to add another ton of users from Helium as it merges over. Let's have a quick look at the NFT marketplace rankings. You can see here, ETH is still 13 times larger than Solana in the latest numbers. 
over the last 30 days. But Solana is growing fast, and it's more than twice what Polygon Matic does. And good news for Cardano fans out there. They just beat out Binance and Flow with $12 million over the last 30 days. Um, but you can see that Solana is nearly nine times larger than that $12 million. But again, NFT is just one little area of business that the chain is used for. Now, speaking of Binance, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, there was a lot of hubbub about this. Binance Australia closes all derivative accounts. And it took a lot of people by surprise, and some people believe it also impacted the market because there was an immediate closure of Binance Australia derivative positions and accounts. And of course, the big usual apology to customers, and they'll give you a refund or payment, etc. But if you're in an options position and you get closed out at the wrong time, that can be very, very costly. I would not like somebody to do that to my open options position. Now, in other Binance competitor news, this is Huobi, and uh, this is... A lot of, again, I don't know if it's true or not, but a lot of news floating around. Uh, does Justin Sun own Huobi? Justin says no. Huobi says no. People around Justin say yes. Some Huobi employees say yes. The media says yes. And if Justin did purchase Huobi, is he following CZ's footsteps in Binance? I don't know. And apparently there's also a bidding war on FTX assets. And this is according to the Wall Street Journal and Internal Resources that Justin Sun is bidding in a war for some FTX assets and is most likely to win it. But it's still in bankruptcy. Chapter 11, so how can bidding be done? I don't know. We'll see. But it could just be a PR stunt. But then, after my video about China yesterday, there it is. <laughs> I did say, you know, Hong Kong is dying to be the crypto hub of not only Asia, but the world. And uh, this just came out from uh, Will Be Two. Excited news that Will Be stoked about Hong Kong's pro crypto policies, and we're working hard to secure a crypto license there. So more people moving to Hong Kong. So good for them. Um, let's switch gears and talk about stocks for a second. Um, this is related to AI, and there's been a growing frenzy around all things artificial intelligence, which will ultimately produce long-term winners and losers. NVIDIA is one of my many AI plays. In fact, most of the stuff I'm in is AI-related on the equity side. That's things like Tesla, NVIDIA, Meta, etc. But NVIDIA looks to be positioning itself as a potential winner. But right now, I do believe there's a bit of hype, um, at least in the eyes of investors. It is trading at 75 times earnings, but NVIDIA is a beast. <laughs> if you invested $10,000 10 years ago, that would be worth nearly $650,000 today. And it's outpacing the S&P 500 by a mile. It is one of the best performing stocks. Uh, and it is very disruptive. Um, but if you look at the earnings themselves, you know, revenue declined to 21% year over year to $6.05 billion. Gross margin was down 200 basis points to 63%. Operating income was $1.25 billion, down from $2.9 billion. That is a huge, huge haircut. Uh, net income of 1.4 billion is down from 3 billion, and data center revenue grew 11% to 3.62 billion. Remember, it's going to be a huge arms race to get those chips to get into those data centers to run things like ChatGPT. And gaming revenue declined 46%. So when you look at all of that stuff, that is a really, really, really big, big headache. So, um, but why do I like Nvidia? Well. I believe in AI, and I believe they have the strongest moat. I did a video back in 2022 comparing, uh, somebody asked me in the Q&A to compare NVIDIA to AMD. And my money, obviously, is I put my money where my mouth is, was on NVIDIA. But if you look at the moats here, this brilliant little chart of AMD versus NVIDIA, just a refresher, you will see a whole bunch of cool information. Free cash flow margin, NVIDIA wins. Value, you could argue, AMD is a much higher value. Dividend yield, AMD don't pay dividend. NVIDIA do, albeit very small. Return on investment capital, <laughs> nobody beats them except for Tesla. Altman Z-score, way stronger. Financials and balance sheet. R&D revenue to ratio, way better. Well, not way better, but better than AMD. So with that, I do believe NVIDIA will be a force to be reckoned with. But, you know, what's really interesting is the markets have seen a huge slowdown in things like processors, PCs, orders, and Q3, Q4. The Fed doesn't know about it yet, but literally many, many sectors have ground to a halt. We'll talk about one of those in a minute, too. Um, let's talk about Tesla. Speaking of margins and earnings, 
Tesla went from worst only three years ago in the amount of profit margin they made to the being by far the biggest leader today over the companies like Toyota, Volkswagen, BYD, etc. They crash it. And but the crazy thing about this, what's really insane about this chart is they are only just beginning to ramp up, ladies and gentlemen. So it is pff, crazy times. Final piece of news today, as you know, in transit, etc. This is a little piece on the actual mortgage collapse. Thanks, Jerome Powell. Great job. Mortgage applications to buy a house collapsed to an index level of about 147. That's the lowest level of buyer demand in 30 years, ladies and gentlemen. Way worse than the 2008 global financial crisis, and it's down 41% from last year. And this is from the Mortgage Bankers Association. And the Fed are still turning the screws. If anybody wants me to do a global real estate update, drop a comment below. And remember, drop a comment below if you want me to do some Metcalf's Law calculations on the impact of daily active users across Solana and Ethereum and comparison market values to things like Apple, gold, etc. I will run the numbers for you all, but let me know in the comment below. I'm trying to get out of the shadow ban still. Thank you so much for being here. I'll be back at base real soon, everybody.